All right. Now, um, of course, Sunday night, we're in our second part of our series on the family, and we're going to be covering the husbands. Last week, we covered the wives. This week, we're going to be just attacking the, the husbands and going after the husbands and, and um, seeing what God has in store for us. Now, we're, we read Genesis chapter 3 because, again, I like starting at the beginning here. Um, there's some good truths to learn for the husband and for the wife. If you, if you remember in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So God decided, the re we covered this last week, but the reason why God even made woman is because he was trying to find a good help for Adam, a good helper for Adam. And um, last week, of course, we talked about the wives and their job and their roles of being a good help. But... There's only one reason that a man needs help in the first place, and that's because a man has a very important and a, and a difficult job to do. The, the man, the husband's job is a large task, so we can't underestimate that, and we have to understand that, look, get used to it, men. You're on this planet. You're here to work. We have to work hard. We have to work hard to support our families, and God has given us a help in a wife, okay? But that help is, is mainly, you know, someone who's doing the help is not doing nearly the amount of work on whatever the, the job is as the person who's, you know, getting the help, right? I mean, when, I, when my boss says, hey, I need a little help with this, he's been working on something for a long time and he's putting all his effort into it. He's just asking for a little assistance in something and then I'm going back. So the, the help that the wife can provide for the husband, she's got her own job to do and we went over all that last week. She's going to be able to help you out, but the reason why you even get that help is because you have a big burden, you have a big task in front of you that you are responsible for. Let's look down here at verse 17, because of course, chapter 3, Genesis, is when Adam and Eve sinned and they ate of the, the forbidden fruit, and then God sends these curses on them. Look at verse 17, it says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So he's saying, look, you're going to have to work for your food. When they were in the Garden of Eden, everything was great. They didn't have to work that hard. They, you know, God provided everything for them. They didn't have to till the land. They didn't have to worry about, you know, raising crops. God had everything taken care of for them. It was a perfect place. They could just freely eat of the, of the fruit that God's provided for them. But after that sin, God says, okay, now look, man, you are going to eat your bread by the sweat of your face, the sweat of your brow. You're going to have to work for it. You have to work hard for it. He says, till thou return unto the ground. So, in my mind, what that tells me is that don't even think about retirement. Right? I mean, a lot of people these days, they go into retirement, but God's saying, look, until you return in the ground, you've got a lot of work to do. Okay. Now, you know, if you've got a lot, of, you get a great position, you earn a lot of money and a lot of finance, you're financially secure, you know, okay, great. You don't have to work at that type of a job to support your family anymore, but that doesn't mean you stop working. You know, you need to keep working. You need to keep working until the day you die. God has a lot of work laid out for you. In uh, 1 Timothy 5, 8, you don't have to turn there. If you would, please turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. But 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So husbands, one of your primary jobs is to provide food and sustenance for your family. That is your job. The wife's job is not to go out to work. Don't send your wife out to get a job. Your, your job is to bring home enough to be able to support your family and to support everything else. And it's amazing to me that we live in such a backward society today where you have these deadbeat fathers, deadbeat husbands that just sit at home, they collect unemployment, they don't do anything, and their wife is the one that's going out and providing for their family. And they just sit on their lazy rear ends and don't do anything about it. 2 Thessalonians 3 has an answer for that. But it says here, the Bible says that, look, if you don't provide for your own, and especially those for your own household, he says you've denied the faith, you're worse than an infidel. 
An infidel is someone who doesn't believe God's word, just an unbeliever, a heathen. He said, if you're not providing for your own family husbands, you are worse than an infidel. I don't care what your issue is. You get off your rear end and you get to work. That's what God has commanded for you to do, husbands. It's your job to go out. It's your job to make sure you make enough money to provide and to make ends meet. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be rich. It doesn't mean you have to be making six figures. But whatever your family needs, you need to be able to, to fit those needs. And you need to go out and work hard. And if that means taking two jobs or three jobs or whatever you have to do, you work and provide for your family. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, are you there? Look at verse number 7. It says, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. So he's saying, look, this is the example there set forth. We labored night and day. We stayed up late in work. We were working early in the morning that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Because they didn't want them you know, taking care of them. They were just going to work and do it themselves. And this is the job. This is an example he was leading. And verse number nine says, Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. So in their position, you know, the Apostle Paul, they could have required that they, that they supply their needs, that they supply their food and stuff, because they were living of the gospel. They were preaching the gospel. It would have been right and it would have been perfectly acceptable for them to say, Hey, we're doing this work for God. You need to help us out and, you know, and, and, and feed us and clothe us, you know, whatever, whatever needs that they might have needed to have met. But they decided not to do that because they wanted to show these people an example that, look, we labored night and day. They're not only doing the work of God, they're also laboring and working with their hands that they wouldn't be chargeable to anybody, that they could pay their own way through. Verse number 10 says, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work neither should he eat. And I wish the men of America would take this type of an attitude and get that through their heads that say, look, if you're not willing to go out, if you're not willing to go put into work, just say, oh, that job's below me. No, it's not. Go dig a ditch. Go work at McDonald's. Do whatever you have to do, but you need to support your family. Don't just sit at home and collect a welfare check and, and, and collect money from the government and just, just suck on the tea to the government. And, and, not be a man because men are supposed to work. Men are supposed to go out and provide for their family. And if you're not working, you ought not eat. You ought not to get a meal until you can provide for yourself and provide for your family. Verse number 11 says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. And again, I know there's different, everyone's in a different situation. There's all kinds of things going on. But I'll tell you what, it, for me and for my family, probably the last thing I would want to do is take a handout from the government. And I know there's all kinds of different situations out there. But all I'm saying is that I'm going to work, if I'm going to work my fingers to the bone and do whatever is necessary, pick up whatever odd jobs I can, and, and just anything that's available, if it means that's what I have to do to feed my family, then that's what I'm going to have to do. And that I'm going to learn that with quietness, I'm going to work, I'm going to eat my own bread. I'm not going to eat someone else's bread, I'm going to eat my own bread. Now, I know people fall in hard times, and it gets to a point where maybe you do need some kind of charity. I'll, I'll tell you what, the last place I'm going to turn to is the government for help. Um, it's just going to turn in. They just want to control you and they always want to take the place of God. We ought to be relying on God to help us to find work, to help us to find a job. If you're willing to work, look, I have not met anyone that is willing to go out and spend the time out looking for a job that just is not able to get any kind of work. I've yet to find that type of a person. The people who aren't able to find work are the ones that are just finding all kinds of other stuff to do with their time, whether watching TV, playing on their iPhones, or doing anything else, instead of just going out and spending every single waking hour out trying to find work. People who do that, they find jobs right away. Everyone I know that's ever been like that has found work within like weeks, easily. But it's our job as men to go out and work and provide for your family. The Bible says if you don't do that, you're worse than an infidel. <clears throat> Genesis 3.16, you don't have to turn back there. If you would, please turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. 
One of the primary functions of the man is to work and to work hard and make sure you're providing for your family. That is one of the, there's, there's two things that are, that are basically um, gone over quite a bit with men and with husbands. And that's one of those working hard. Genesis 3.16 said, we read this last week, unto the woman he said, I will greatly, excuse me, multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, we read this last week because it applies to women, but the end of that one says, he shall rule over thee. That applies to the husband. Because your job, husband, is the, in the family, is to rule the household. You are the ruler. That is a position that you need to fill, and you ought to fill it. Don't be one of these husbands that basically is letting your wife rule. That's just giving up the authority that's God given to you and just say, oh yeah, well, whatever you think. You know, it's not a vote. It's not always, well, just ask your wife every single time a decision making comes up and just say, well, whatever she says, I'm just going to go with. That is a very ineffective way to lead. You are put in the position of ruling. You are the one that's supposed to be making the decisions. And God has put it that way for a reason. Now, it, mean, it does not mean that your wife's input means nothing. That's not what I'm saying here. But there's a difference in, in leading. If you're the one that's making the decisions and you're the one that's in charge, it should be known as opposed to just, you know, coming up with a vote or just always deferring to your wife when something needs to be done. Don't be, there's, there's way too many men out there that are just not filling the role as a man and as a husband and as the ruler of the house. Your job is to rule over the house. And you're in charge, you need to fill that role. So if you're going to do that role, you better make sure that you're a good ruler. Okay, being a good, being a ruler, look, there's a lot of negative connotation with this. When I say being a ruler and ruling the household, that doesn't mean that you have to be some you know, horrible dictator that's just like, makes everyone's life miserable, right? It doesn't mean you have to be a Hitler, okay? In order to be a ruler, I mean, you, you have good rulers, you have bad rulers, right? But the God has designed that the man is the ruler, but you want to make sure that you're a good ruler. It's, it's an important position to lead your family. That's a lot of responsibility that's put on your shoulders, husband or father, to make sure that your family goes in the right direction. You're making decisions that's going to affect everybody. It doesn't just affect you. Maybe when you're single and off on your own, you can make decisions. It didn't really matter that much because you're the only ones that dealt with the consequence. But when you're in that position, when you're the one at the top, you're the one making the decisions. Hey, you better make sure that you're making the right decisions. Because it's not only going to affect you, it's going to affect your wife, it's going to affect your children, it's going to affect everyone else. You need to make sure that everyone's interests are in mind and that you're making wise decisions, that you're smart enough to do that. You're in 1 Kings chapter 3, look at verse number 6. This is Solomon. Solomon gets put in his great position of authority, taking over the kingdom from his father. Huge kingdom of the children of Israel. He's got a lot of responsibility being the ruler of these people. Look what he says here in verse 6. It says, And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, thy father, great mercy according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of, my, instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. See, Solomon's great wish is that he could just, because he knows it's a big task. He knows he's going to be making decisions that are going to affect a lot of people. He knows it's an extremely important position that he's been put with. And he's going to God and saying, look, God, I don't know how to handle this. I need your help. I want you to teach me. I want you to give me wisdom so that I can discern between good and bad, so that I can make the right choices. I want to be able to make the right decisions. And you, man of the household, you are the spiritual leader in the house. Since you're the one that God has ordained to be the ruler, you better be able to make the righteous judgments and the decisions for your family which means that you need to get your nose in this book and learn it and read it and memorize it and know what God has for you so you can discern 
right from wrong. You can make the wise decisions on the wisdom that God has given you from his word. Because I'll tell you what, you can learn the wisdom of this world, but it's foolishness with God. If you want to be able to make the right decisions for your family, if you want to be able to protect your family from evil influences, if you want to make the right, the best decisions, you need to know the Bible. And God has put you in charge. You need to make sure that you are doing more than your wife is doing. Whatever Bible reading your wife is doing, you better make sure you're doing more. Whatever it is, you need to stay ahead because you're the one in charge. You need to be the leader of that household. Now, Abraham was a great example of a godly husband. Turn, if you would, please, to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. I'm going to read you here about Abraham in Genesis 18. It says in verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, this is God speaking, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. Abraham was an excellent example of a father and a husband and a leader. Abraham filled his role excellently to the point where God knows him. God knows Abraham. He says, I know Abraham. I know he is going to command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. So not only is he going to command them, they're going to listen. It's one thing to just give commands. But one of the, one of the key um, attributes of being a good leader, one of the evidences that you are a good leader, is not when you give the command, but are the people following? Are people obeying? Are people listening to you? If you have a problem with your wife listening to you and listening to your commands, husband, maybe you need to take a step back and analyze how you're ruling and just take a look at it and see if you're ruling correctly because a good leader is going to get people to follow. A good, I mean, you can think about it. Think about some of the great leaders throughout history. They didn't have to like coerce people or threaten them in order to get them to follow them. They were just good leaders for other reasons. They got people motivated. They found out how to instill you know, a, a, a cause for them to want to follow you. And one of the best ways you can lead is by example. You're not just being some dictator that's always telling other people what to do. Look, if you want people like it, for example, I'm a leader in this church. I'm the pastor of this church. If I want to get people out soul winning, I'm not just going to command it. I'm going to go out and do the work. I need to be the good example. I need to be the first one out there. I need to be one spending the most time out there and saying, look, follow me because this is the example that we're setting forth. The same way that Paul put forth the example of working hard with their, with their hands, working, laboring night and day so that then they can tell the other people, okay, look, we're not being chargeable, any of you. You better not be busybodies walking around and working not. We've been working night and day, and we've been doing this other work. You can do it too. If we can do that, you can do it too. And being a good leader means, for one, you know, you want to be respected, then be respectable. Be someone who is a man of your word. Be someone who is doing a lot of hard work so that your wife can see evidently, hey, my husband is working hard, and that she understands that the work that you're doing is not just for you. When she can see that the work that you're putting forth, hey, my husband really cares about my family. Hey, my husband's doing all this work to support us and to provide for us. And he cares about us. And every chance he gets, he's trying to do things for us and work hard for us. When your wife sees that, she's going to have a lot more respect for you and is going to be a lot more likely to fall into her submissive role. Now, it's a two-way street. I can't say that every single time, absolutely, without a doubt, that the wife is going to fall into her role, but that is not your concern whether what she does. I mean, it is your concern in the sense that, hey, as a leader, you better think about the proper way to lead your family and lead your wife and make sure that you figure out the, the best way to do that. And that it's not always just going to be coming from yelling and making threats and stuff. There's better ways to lead than that. And pray to God, if you need help in that area, that God will give you wisdom to discern the good from the bad. And God can help you in order to lead your household and get people the, the motivation that they need to want to follow you and to trust you and to trust that the decisions that you're making are going to be good for, the, for your family. 
If you're in 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 2. Now, these are the qualifications for a pastor. But we're going to see here that the pastor's qualifications are tied in real closely with the fact that he's a father and one that rules his household well. Look at verse number 2. It says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So this like that explains why does a person have to be a good father, a good husband in charge of their own house and ruling their own house well. Well, in order for that person to be a pastor, because how can you take care of the church of God if you're not doing that already with your family? Which your family is going to be a lot smaller than the church of God. The church of God, you got a lot more people to be accountable for. Now, this list is for men. And, and you know what? This list gives the qualifications for a bishop. But if you want to have a successful marriage, I would apply this list to yourself. If you want to be a good leader, because, hey, the qualification for the pastor, the pastor needs to be a good leader, right? If you have all these attributes, basically the Bible's saying that you're fit to be a leader, that you're, you, you will be acceptable then as a pastor of a church and be able to lead a church. If you have all of these, you ought to be able to lead your household, right? So look at these attributes that you can be blameless. You know, the husband of one wife, don't go out divorcing your wife, right? That's not going to be a very good um, example of a husband there. It's not going to do you very good if you're divorcing your wife. But be vigilant. Vigilant means you're always aware. You're always looking out for things. Look out for your family's safety. Look out for, for you know, wickedness that's going to try to creep into your house. You need to be on the lookout for these things because it's going to come in in all variety. I mean, with the kids, I need to be vigilant about the books that they read, about the media that they see, about the communication that they have with other people. You need to be vigilant for this stuff because you don't want to have wickedness and sin come into this house. And with my wife, it's the same thing with everything. I mean, you need to be vigilant and watch over to protect your entire household. That is your job. You are in charge of protecting your house. So not only vigilance as sober, you ought not to be going out and getting drunk. I mean, you're not going to be very vigilant if you're not sober. Of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. As a spiritual leader, it falls on you as well to teach your household, teach your children, and yes, teach your wife. The Bible talks about if a, you know, if a woman um, should learn anything, let her ask her husband at home. When, it, when it's talking about a woman or it's not permitted for them to speak in church. Well, husband, if your wife's going to be asking you questions like the Bible says, if they have a question, you ought to be able to answer it. Again, that is your job. You're in that position of authority, that you're in that charge of leadership. You ought to be able to answer her. So you ought to also be able to apt, apt to teach, be able to teach your wife some, some truths from the Bible. Not given to wine, no striker. That's a great one for married couples. <laughs> don't be a striker. Don't be, don't be beating your wife. Not greedy of filthy lucre. And, you know, you ought not to be greedy because your greed, greed comes from a covetous heart. It comes from a heart that's very selfish, where you're only thinking about yourself. You think about the money that you can get when your thought ought to be on the others in your household. It, it, you put yourself last. You do the most work, but what you're doing is you're elevating your wife and you're elevating your children above you, and you're trying to do as much as possible to help them out. That should be your prime, that should be where your heart is, and that should be your primary goal as a husband, is to be able to, to make sure that they are doing well at your own cost, at your own loss, whatever it may be. So a greedy heart is not something that you want to have where you agree with filthy lucre because that's just going to lead you to be selfish and just be focused on yourself instead of be focusing on other people. You need to be patient. You're not a brawler, don't be getting brawls with your wife. And not covetous. Again, we went over that. But it is important to be patient. Okay, you as as a married couple, you know, with especially with children, you need to learn how to have patience. Don't fly off the handle of time. Again, that is not a sign of a strong leader. When you just get angry all the time and when you just spout off everything, you ought to be able to take things as patience. And I know, husbands and wives, you know what the buttons are that you can press. You know which ones are going to get people riled up. Try not to push those buttons. <laughs> 
Sometimes they get pushed, but, but learn how to be patient with it. And it's difficult, and it's going to take time to, to be able to, to establish that trait to where you can be patient, but I guarantee you it's going to help your leadership skills as a husband and as the head of the household if you can develop that and, and just force yourself to be patient. When that button is pushed, just wait. Don't respond immediately. Have that filter in place where you can just bite your tongue and just wait a second. Because I'll tell you what, it's going to work out a lot better for you. You're going to end up leading much better when you can recognize that it's you know an argument or discussion is going a certain way and things are going to fight you. You just hold back and stop. Be patient and and try to continue moving forward without um, a lot of words being exchanged that ought not to be exchanged. So 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, we went through that list. And then verse 4 says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now that word gravity there is very important because that means, he's talking about your children being in subjection. That means your children listen and obey what you say. They understand that you're the boss that you're in charge and when you tell them to do something, they're going to do it. And the reason why you have to do it with all gravity, gravity is weight. It's seriousness. When you say something, you're not just kidding. You're not just joking around. So, you know, I like joking with my kids. I like having a good time. I like playing with them and having fun. But at the same time, when it comes down to it, if I want them to do something, I'm going to tell them they're going to know when I'm serious and they're going to know when I'm joking. So don't be the type of guy that's just always joking and never serious so that no one is ever going to treat you seriously. You know, people just laugh at you, oh, ha, 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 yeah, that's funny, and not listen to what you have to say. You have to be sober. You have to have some seriousness. You have to have some gravity when you deal with ruling your household. <clears throat> now, turn, if you would, please, to Ephesians chapter number 5. I told you we're hitting we're hitting almost all the same places that we did last week, because the same scripture that talks about the wife's role are the same scripture that talks about the husband's role. We're going to shift gears a little bit here, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier. But the the other main theme for husbands, besides um, you know working hard and providing for your family, is loving your wives. Now we saw last week. One of the, the main theme for the wife is just, you know, be in subjection to your husband and, and take on that submissive role. Well, on the flip side, for the husbands, one of the main themes is loving your wives. So look down at Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 25. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So the level of love, before we saw the, the level that the, the wife's obedience should be to the husband is the same way that their level of obedience would be to Christ. Well, in like manner, husbands, the way that you should love your wife should be as much as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It's a selfless love. It's a love that says, I love you so much, I'm going to go through anything for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow myself to be nailed to a cross, get whipped, beaten, mocked, ridiculed, go through whatever it takes because of my love for you. If that's going to help you out, then I'm willing to go through that. That is the type. We have to have a Christ-like love for our wives in order to fulfill our role as a husband. Look at verse 26. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So here, you know, we, we flip back and forth between husbands loving their wives and Christ loving the church. And he's giving us this example because this is exactly how we ought to love our wives. And look at the purpose for Christ loving the church so much. The purpose in verse number 26 is that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Okay, so one of your goals as a husband, as a leader, as a spiritual leader, and as the ruler of the household, you're going to love your wife in such a way that you might be able to present a glorious wife, right, not having spot or wrinkle, and um, that she can be holy without blemish. You want her to be able to improve in her spiritual life 
and her walk with God. You want to be a help unto her the same way that Christ is a help unto the church that he could present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. We need to be thinking about our wives and saying, you know, again, as the ruler, what can I do to make sure, you know, one example is getting the sin out of the house. Okay? If there's something that, that's not good for your wife, that's not good for your children, maybe it's something that they like. Maybe your wife likes turning on the TV and watching some soap operas or something. Hey, as the husband, you are in charge of that household, and if you know that there's filth coming through that TV shed, go throw it away and throw it in the dumpster and smash it to bits. And, I'll t and it's only going to do good for your wife because... What you're doing is you're cleansing, you're sanctifying your household, you're getting the sin out that, that won't be a deterrent, that, that won't be drawing back and, um, and having a negative effect on your wife or on your children. These are the types of things that you need to look out for, but it's not just that. You need to keep your eyes open to what your wife is doing and, and some of her needs that need to be met, especially in her spiritual life where maybe she's struggling with something, you can help out with that. You can study that out in the Bible. You can help teach that to her to help her to grow and to, and to become um, just more spiritual and a more, and a more Christian lady in God's eyes. And we need to have that type of love to where you're willing to go through anything for her. You're willing to just, to just do what it takes to, to get your wife to have that type of a benefit of um, you know, not having spot or wrinkle. It says in verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. You think about how much you care for and, and watch out for your own self and for your own body. Hey, you need to love your wife at least that much. Because it says, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Verse 29, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. I mean... You're going to take care of yourself. If you're hungry, you're going to eat. You know, you're going to, you're going to do things that you need to do. You're going to keep yourself clothed. You're going to keep yourself fed. Hey, do the same for your wife. Make sure that she's clothed. Make sure that she's fed. Don't just think, well, I'm the only important one here because I'm the ruler. So, you know, we don't have very much food. I'm just going to eat all the food and, and go out and, and I'm the one in charge here. You know, that's, that's not showing very good love for your wife at all, right? And um, hopefully you're not in that situation, but I mean, if you were, I mean, if you're struggling financially or whatever, hey, husband, you go out and work even harder to make sure that your wife has something to eat, to make sure that she has something to wear. I mean, you're going to take care of yourself, wouldn't you? If you're going to take care of yourself, you better take care of her too. It says for this, um, verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. I mean, the Bible says right there, when you become married, when you're husband and wife, you are one flesh anyway, so you need to be treating your wife as if it's yourself. You need to be treating you know, her needs as if, as if they're yours because you are one flesh. This is a great mystery, verse 32, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So over and over again, I mean, this whole chapter is just talking about how husbands, have, you have to love your wives. And it shouldn't be a difficult thing to do. Hopefully you married your wife because you loved her already. But, um, you know, as you, as you grow together, you need to just to make sure that, that, you know, your family is your primary focus, that you're able to, that you're doing things to support them and that you do love them and that your wife is aware that you love her. I mean, your wife needs to know these things. When I talk about men and women being different, right? And I said men want to have respect. Hey, women want to know that they're loved. Women want to know that you're thinking about them. Women want to know that you care about them. And um, sometimes you need to do things to, to show them that love. And I mean, as guys, it can be hard to, to even understand that because you don't think that way. You don't operate that way. But your wife does. And God knows that your wife thinks that way. And he's dedicated all kinds of scripture telling you that you need to love your wives. And she needs to make it to, to feel and know that you love your wife. Colossians 3.19, you don't have to turn there. says, um, turn if you would to 1 Peter 3.7. But Colossians 3.19 says, husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them. This is, it's only one verse in Colossians 3 about the husbands right there. But it's a very important one because it says to love your wives. We saw all that in Ephesians 5. 
But then he adds, and be not bitter against them. And this has to go with being patient, okay? A lot of times you might get into arguments, you might get into disputes, your wife not respect you the way that you think that she ought to respect you. Do not let yourself get bitter against your wife. Maybe your wife does something completely wrong. You're like, yeah, but I'm right. It doesn't matter. Don't be bitter against your wife. You need to be able to forgive and forget. The last thing that you need in your marriage is to have that root of bitterness springing up inside of you. Because that is just going to develop into hatred and just, and just bad feelings. And you're not going to be loving your wife the way that you ought to if, you, if you're holding on to that bitterness and if you're not able to forget. The Bible says that um, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Okay? When you get in these fights, when you have these arguments, you might get really angry. Look, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. By the end of the day, you ought to be able to say, you know what, I'm gonna, uh, I forgive her. Or I forgive him. I mean, that's a two-way street as far as the forgiveness goes. But the Bible is laying this out specifically for husbands to love your wives, be not bitter against them. They do something wrong. They fail some, in some aspect. They don't do what you're commanding them to do or whatever. You might need to deal with the problem, but don't be bitter against them. You don't want to have a bitterness in your marriage. You're in 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 7. The Bible says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, talking about wives, according to knowledge. Again, knowledge is important. Having that wisdom, having God's wisdom, having God's knowledge is very key and critical to ruling your house well. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Your wife is weaker than you. And the Bible says that the wife is the weaker, the woman is the weaker vessel. Again, one of the reasons why the man has to work hard to support the wife because you're giving honor unto her because she is weaker. She's not going to be able to do all the things that you can do. She's not going to be able to do the same hard work that you can do. So you need to be able to provide for yourself and for her and give honor unto her because she is the weaker vessel. And not only that, this is important too. I think this kind of goes hand in hand with not being bitter against them. It says, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Don't let your position of being the ruler and being in charge of the household get to your head in the sense that you don't understand that you're heirs together, right? If you're both saved, you're heirs together of the grace of life. You're not better than her and she's not better than you because God has put you in that one role and in that position of authority. You are both heirs together. You are brother and sister when it comes to God and when it comes to serving him and when it comes to being saved and receiving his grace and his eternal life. So don't let yourself forget that, that, that you kind of start getting a superiority complex. You need to, and, and again, if you're loving your wife well, you shouldn't have that problem. If you're loving your wife appropriately, you're going to be escalating her, elevating her status in the sense that you're concerned about her, you're caring for her, and you're going to do what it takes to take care of her. You are still making the decisions you are still in charge, but you're not going to let it get to your head because you know that, hey, she's extremely important. She's raising the kids. She's doing her job. I'm going to do mine. I'm going to love her. And just remember that we're heirs together of the grace of life. First, or Titus 2, you don't have to turn there. Well, yeah, go ahead and turn to Titus 2. There's a, there's a few verses in there that we're going to look at. We're almost done. I only got um, after Titus 2. If you want to turn to Titus 2 and then put a finger in 1 Corinthians 7, those are the last places we're going to turn to tonight. Titus chapter 2. This more has to do with men in general than specifically for husbands, but it's applicable for husbands. The Bible says in Titus 2, 2, that the aged men be sober... Again, this is a very similar list to what we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 3. That the age of men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. Excuse me. That's older men. But again, you start that way when you're younger, and then you'll be that way when you're older. Be sober, grave, again, gravity, the seriousness, temperate, don't be flying off the handle. Sound in faith. Make sure that you're that you're rooted and grounded in the Bible, and um, and that you know the Scripture and that you're able to give answers in charity and patience. And again, patience is important. Look at verse number six. Let's go down to young men. 
Titus 2, 6 says, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. It's important to stay sober, keep yourself level, keep yourself um, serious at times, you know? I mean, don't always be screwing around. Verse 7, in all things, showing, that, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Again, a good ruler. If you're in that position of ruling, I don't care what position, you know, whether you're ruling your house or ruling anywhere, pastor of a church, ruling at a job, people are going to be listening to the things that you say. The words that come out of your mouth are going to be very important. Choose your words wisely and make sure that you're not, you know, that you have that filter in place as we preached about a few weeks ago, that you're not just saying the first thing that comes to your mind, that you can, you can hold back, be temperate, and that you have sound speech that cannot be condemned. Again, as a ruler, as someone that's put in a position of authority, when you start saying things that are wrong, and when you start saying just, and just not just wrong, but like when you're, when you're using speech that's going to condemn you, that can be condemned, the respect level is going to go down. Um, and it says that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. You don't want your wife to be able to look at you and, and know you and look at what you're doing and the things that you say and just have an evil report of you because you're just saying things that are wicked or you're saying things that are just completely off base and wrong. You know, you ought to try to keep yourself unspotted and keep yourself up to a level that, you know, will, will make you shine as a good example of the leader that you ought to be because there are going to be people looking for those flaws. And even if they're not looking for you, I mean, even if you're not looking for the, for, you know, to, fight, to try to find anything against you, right? I mean, she shouldn't be. But it'll become obvious if, if, you, if you do have evil communication, if you are um, not wise with your speech and, and that um, there are evil things to be said about you. So just keep that in mind. You know, you need to keep yourself to a very high standard as the ruler of the house if you want to rule well, if you want your, your household to be run very well. And 1 Corinthians 7 is the last place we're going to turn. 1 Corinthians 7. And this is now kind of more for, for husbands and wives. We didn't turn there last week. 1 Corinthians 7. Look at verse number 3. 1 Corinthians 7 says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Benevolence is a lot of love. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. This is a two-way street, right? Husbands need to love their wives. Wives love your, your husbands as well. And render due benevolence. It says in verse 4, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now the Bible is explaining here that look, when you're married, and this is one instance where actually the husband is not in charge. You're not in charge of your own body when it comes to the physical relationship that you have with your wife. He says, you know, the wife, you don't have you know, control of your body in that sense. And the husband, you also don't have control of your body. You, you need to be able to come together and, and frequently because you don't want Satan to tempt you for your incontinency. So don't be holding back and withholding yourself and defrauding yourself from your spouse, whether you're a husband or a wife. God recognized that, look, that relationship is important. Having that, that physical relationship in your marriage is important. And you don't want to have one person just abstaining and withdrawing because even if they may think they're okay, what about your spouse? What about the other person? You don't want Satan to come and then tempt your spouse because you're withholding a physical relationship from them because of your incontinency. And the Bible saying is very clear saying, look, if either, if either person in that relationship wants to have a physical relationship, you need to yield to that and just and, and that's the way it is. That's what the Bible teaches here. And um, again, that's the reason why I bring that up, for one, it has to do with husbands and wives. And, um, and you know, it's part of being a loving husband as well is, is making sure that you are not only doing all of your other jobs that are important and looking out for your wife 
and loving her in the sense that you provide for her, and loving her in the sense that, you know, maybe you buy things for her and do nice things for her and say nice things to her, but also loving her in the sense that you're going to, you know, perform what you ought to perform physically with your wife too. And that shouldn't be a problem, but, um, you know, the Bible lays it out here and that's what we need to, to listen to. And I think that if you can follow, you know, so far we've gone through the wives and the husbands. We're going to go next week. We're going to deal with being, you know, with children and raising children and, and everything that has to do with having children um, and their role in the family. But if we can just get that, both roles are not that difficult. <laughs> They're not very complicated. And honestly, if anything is complicated, I think the women's role is more complicated than the men's. I think the men's role is very simple. It's, it's boiled down to work hard, <laughs> go out and support your family, just, just work as hard as you can to do that and love your wife. Like, those are the, the main things. Love your family. Like, just rule your family well. Now, there's a lot of things, I guess, that are involved with ruling well, but that's your job. I mean, your job is to rule and be a good ruler. Pray for wisdom from God to be a better ruler. Be someone who's worthy to be followed. Be someone that's respectable, that, that your wife should have no problems giving you respect because she sees that you work hard. She sees that you, she, that you love her. She knows that you love her and that you're doing all of these things in the best interest of her and the family. If you can get her to, to, to recognize that and see that and realize that, your job's going to be a lot easier as a ruler. Her job's going to be a lot easier getting in her God-given role. It's just, it's just going to work out a lot better. And I guarantee you if, you, if we can follow what the Bible has laid out for us, husbands, Wives, if we can just listen and obey what he has laid out for us to do, and we can just do it, your marriage is going to be great. I mean, God will bless your marriage, and I, and I believe that wholeheartedly, that if we can just fall into our God-given roles where we're supposed to be, you will be blessed with, with a great marriage. Because why, why should it fail? Why would, you, why would you? I mean, look, everyone's got their problem. I'm not saying it's just going to be like absolutely perfect with zero fights, but you will have a very happy marriage and a very blessed marriage. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the guidance that you've given us in, in these really important aspects of our lives here, God. Marrying someone and making that vow to, to stay together with, with another, um, another person for the rest of our lives um, is important. And, and there's a lot of symbolism between the way that, that you deal with the church and in, in the way that our relationship is with our wife, dear God, I pray that you would please just um, help us all to learn from your word and to fill our own individual roles. Whether we're a husband or a wife, God, give us that understanding. Give us the wisdom that we need as men, specifically, dear God, to be, the, to be a good leader, to understand and to make the right decisions for our family, that you would give us the wisdom that we need in order to lead well and to, um, and to always be thinking of our families, dear Lord. And um, we thank you so much for providing the answers for us in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.